Hello, Money Queens and listeners. Welcome to Women Behind the Millions. Let's meet the women behind the millionaires, the women supporting, guiding, celebrating women with their wealth. You will hear from women millionaires, how they got there, what they wish they had known, what got them to be a millionaire, the emotional side, the spiritual side, the practical side of wealth. You'll also get to meet the women behind the scenes helping make it happen. Let's dive into Women Behind the Millions. I am Jessica Weaver, your host, best-selling author of three books, wealth advisor, and founder of The Woman's Wealth Boutique. Let's start meeting the women. Hey, hey, money queens. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of Women Behind the Millions. I am your host, Jessica Weaver, where we talk all things power, prosperity, and the color you guess it, pink. I am thrilled for another edition of our Financial Trendsetters series for Women Behind the Millions. We have one of our co-authors with us tonight for our episode, and it's all about living that dream life. She is a wealth advisor, just like myself, and I love bringing these women to the forefront because they are women that are not going to shame you. They're not going to make you feel bad about your money or your spending. What they are going to do to your life is bring you options. And I feel with money, it's very rare that we feel we do have options. But even if you feel like you are broke or you are in debt or you don't have enough money saved up for retirement, in my world, to me, there is opportunity. Whenever we feel that there is a problem, it's not a problem, it's an opportunity. And we have to start shifting our mind, our thoughts, our beliefs, our behaviors, what we do with our money. And you work with people like tonight's guest because they show you how to do it without having to trial and error it yourself, figure it all out, feeling like you are alone fumbling along where everybody else is building wealth and you are just barely getting by. Before we bring on tonight's guest, as you know, we always start with some sort of grounding exercise presence. And tonight I was going through, you know, doing my show prep. How do I want to start off tonight's episode? And I have all these notes on my phone because I constantly will go to prayers or Bible verses, God's word, mantras, just to center myself throughout the day. And this one came up and I loved it. In the Bible, it says, blessed are those who have faith and cannot see. This means empowered are those who remember who they are, even when circumstances would tempt them to believe otherwise. And as we're recording this, it's the end of the year, and I've been doing a lot of work on, you know, what was this year? Who did I become? What did it mean to me? What was the overall theme? And as I was meeting with my own coach, I was thinking, you know, what was that hard lesson I had to learn? And you've probably been through times in your life where it's a real lesson that you hit over and over and over again. And this was one that has been in my life for years, really ever since I started in the financial industry in 2010. You know, when people leave your world, friendships, partners, clients, advisors, it can feel like a complete failure. And to me, it always felt just reaffirming those beliefs that I am not enough, that I didn't do enough, that there's a reason they left me, I I wasn't worthy of the success. Or, and this happened a lot this year where I had so much success and then this came in and it felt like, oh, I hit my upper barrier limit. I hit the max amount of success that I was going to allow myself to have And then I sabotaged myself and somebody left. And the first few times it happened, I I was so angry, so angry, upset, frustrated. Uh, The industry tells you that you're not, right? You wanna keep everybody possible in your world. It's bad if employees leave, if clients leave, advisors leave, friends leave, right? It means you're, you're changed, you're not good enough for them. And after, I don't know how many times, you know, melting down, crying, upset about this. And it was a mixture. And I'll be real with you. It was a mixture of friends, coaches, clients, advisors. It was a mix. 
finally, I looked, brought God into the picture and said, clearly, this is a lesson that I need to learn and to not be scared of who's going to leave my world. Because by being so scared and trying to hold on to all of these people, these clients, advisors, people in your world, what you end up doing is just becoming a huge people pleaser, huge people pleaser. And when we are in that role, we have very little boundaries set up to protect us, to protect our own energy. And it is, I wish I had my, my journal with me because I wrote down that it is so, it's just so exhausting, exhausting. And that's where I was this summer. It's just that energetic drain of trying to check in with everybody else, worried that who's going to leave, what's the next ball that's going to drop. And I started to see that every time somebody left, this gem was left behind in its place. And I really shifted my perspective and focus that when people leave, they are leaving behind a gem and they are leaving behind room for you to expand. So there are times that people are going to leave your life because it is time for you to expand beyond them. And not too long ago, I was sent, uh, I believe it was on Instagram, this reel, and it was talking about how when you are hurt or broken, there are people that are taking advantage of you being hurt and broken. So you can bet your little behind that when you heal and expand, they are going to be very upset because they can no longer take advantage of you being in your weakest state and taking advantage of you being in trauma and being in an abusive relationship. So you are going to grow and expand beyond them. And they're going to have this little tantrum like my toddler does not knowing how to express their anger properly because there's something that they need to heal, let's be honest, in their own right as well. So I want to ask you, and we're going to do a meditation at the end of tonight's episode, so stay tuned until the end because we're going to break through a lot of these. All right, ladies, we are going to break through this chain that has been keeping you down, that is keeping you in this role of people pleasing and always checking with everybody else, trying to control everything, being super attached to every single outcome, and it's keeping you completely stuck. You're staying in this it's fine zone instead of freaking explosive growth. But what circumstance have you been stuck in? What is tempting you right now? Just like the quote says, right? And part of those who remember who they are, even when circumstances would tempt them to believe otherwise. Can you stand fully in your faith and belief in who you are, who you are meant to be, who God wants you to be, despite what is surrounding you, despite your environment, a relationship, the money? Can you still stand firm in that? How is God asking you to rise up? God says in our weakness, we turn to him and he strengthens us. How can you double down on your faith? How is this circumstance a lesson? How is it repeatable? How can you turn this lesson into your purpose going into the next chapter of your life, into the next year, into the next phase, to that next level? Because if you're near my world, you know there is always, always a next level. So stay tuned until the end because we are going to go into a meditation and I'm going to do a quick shout out to my book Confessions of a Money Queen. You can grab the QR code right here. With it. There we go. Here's a QR code for Confessions of a Money Queen. Grab it. We have some meditations in there already built in. It's a free audio book. You can get more stuff like what we just talked about here. It's 10 Money Moves to Claim Your Power and Prosperity. All right, ladies. And without further ado, whoop. why does he keep doing that? There we go. <laughs> Mercury's in retrograde here. All right, we are going to bring in tonight's guest. I am so excited for her to join us on stage. Here is Carmen Gerhardt. Carmen is a certified financial planner from Muskegon, Michigan. I hope I said that right. She cares about the value of your life, not just the value of your account, your bank account, your investment account, retirement account. She cares about you and the families that she loves to work with. She lives with her husband, Gary, her son, Trip, and their French bulldog. She loves boating, camping, reading, and sports. Welcome, Carmen, to Women Behind the Millions. Thanks for having me. 
<laughs> Thank you for being part of this. She is one of our co-authors for our new book coming February 2024, Financial Trendsetters. And Carmen, you had an early start into the financial industry. Did you start right away in your career? I know you started back in banking. Take us through what that career move was like for you. Yeah, um, when I went off to college, I kind of just took a few classes in everything. My dad was an educator, so he had encouraged me. He said, oh, you'd be a great teacher. So after Education 101, I was like, no, nope, that is not it. And I took a general business class and it just clicked. It was just came really easily to me. It felt like common sense. So I was really comfortable in that world. I started leaning towards accounting because I love numbers and love things that are black and white and realized a couple of years in that maybe some of my personality and being a people person might be a little bit lost in that field. So I ended up switching to finance and got my degree in finance. And two weeks after graduation, I had a job at an insurance company. Um, so I had started in banking just in the summers as a teller um, and right, right out of school, got a job at an insurance company. And it was more of an assistant role, more of a service role. Um, but I worked for a very successful man that had really made a career out of it and really learned a lot working for him. So there's some lessons I took away from that uh, that I still use today that are very valuable. But after seven years, you know, I kind of wanted to make my own way and take a little more control of my life. And my friend Melissa was working at a bank and she'd been kind of trying to recruit me for a couple of years. So she finally moved me over. And within a few months, I had added additional licenses. I was selling, I took the leap into being commission-based instead of salaried, which is huge and scary if you've ever gone through that process. But you know, they told me once you go commission, you never go back. And they were right. <laughs> so after six years of working at the bank, uh, transitioning from service to selling, getting more licenses, becoming a certified financial planner, um, there became to be just a little bit of a, I was morally stressed trying to fit all of the goals and fit into uh, the columns that the bank wanted me to be in. And being a fiduciary, I felt like I had extended my responsibilities and I really wanted to keep my client's best interest uh, in mind. And I was kind of tired of making all the, you know, middle level managers in Columbus, Ohio, really rich. And I wanted to run things my way. So I took the leap to go independent and start my own practice. Wow. So you started, we have a background in insurance, background in banking. I mean, very strong start to your career and in infrastructure to make that leap. I want to talk about going from salary to commissions. So when you're making that leap, are you starting from the ground up to rebuild that salary, right? what your current income is? Yeah, I was in my first job at the insurance company. I had a pretty low salary and then I would get bonuses based on my boss's production. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the golden handcuff was, um, and he definitely liked to think outside the box. So, you know, he would buy me Tiffany's jewelry or send me on a trip as bonuses. Um, you know, I had a lot of Friday afternoons in the summer off. So there were some golden handcuffs that I think maybe had me staying a little bit longer mm -hmm. than I should have. Um, and it's scary. I had a lot of bills. I had student loans. I had credit card debt. Um, and so it was scary to take the leap. So when I first transitioned to the bank, I was working for Melissa as her assistant. And within, I think it was seven months, her uh, salesperson left and she was starting to interview people. And I finally told her, just let me do it. I know I can do better than all of these people. And she said, I know you can too. I've been trying to tell you that. <laughs> So she said, I'm going to guarantee your salary for you for six months, but I know you're not going to need it. And within three months, I was already making more than my salary and I never looked back. Wow. So, three months, very quick ramp up. 
It really was. And I had many branches under me and I coached uh, licensed bankers. And so I had a lot of different, you know, pieces to my role, which I enjoyed being on the go, you know, kind of having a different environment, working with different people of different circumstances. I liked that coaching part of it. Mm -hmm. So it was really great. So I got additional licenses. I always say I'm a really good test taker. I have every number under the sun, 663, 65, 724. I mean, every, I'm the alphabet soup of of licenses. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And just kind of moved up. But when I got the CFP, you know, that was, it just really got me thinking about people's goals. So not just selling a product, but really helping them work through the process. And anyone in this industry knows there's not a lot of immediate gratification. You're working on a plan for somebody and it might be that they're not going to retire for 15 or 20 years. And so you really are working the plan, um, customizing, revising as life events happen. Yes. So you like switching to that more goals oriented kind of work and it's a, it's a long relationship versus a transaction. Well, at the bank, we had to start from zero on the first of every month. So we had a new goal. So it became more and more difficult after six years of really finding success in that role to always have to get a new client on the first of every month. And I wanted to continue working with and expanding relationships and servicing the clients whose trust I'd already earned. But the payout structure made it extremely difficult to do that. So it became about transactions and not relationships. And it started to get really uncomfortable for oh, me. Sure. So the industry standard, I think, is that one advisor should have 200 to 250 good clients. And I think I had a thousand at the bank. <laughs> so it was, I just never wanted to make a promise I couldn't keep. And I felt that that was starting to happen. There was a push for crossover, like you have to sell this many insurance policies or you have to sell our mutual funds or you need to um, refer new checking accounts to the bank. And it just became a moral issue for me, specifically when I got the CFP is I just really started seeing big picture and it wasn't able to fit my square peg into their round hole for what they wanted me to do any longer. Thank you for sharing this because people don't understand the side of the business. And no matter what, there is always a transactional cost when it comes to money, right? The banks are just giving people money to give them money either. But to see, and I could see how learning going through the CFP program when I went through it, your eyes are opening up to there are different ways to work with clients could be on the same side of the table versus trying to sell them something but the position how you get paid similar to the clients as well well in the insurance company i worked for it was not a brokerage it was one company so they were very specific on their product and then the bank i worked for had their own mutual funds and their own products and so then when i started thinking about this unbiased just plethora of options that were available to people that weren't really on my approved platform of what I was supposed to be selling. That really opened my eyes as well. Oh, I'm sure. Yes. It's some conflicts of interest, we'll say. Yes. In the era of in both of those experiences were very valuable to me with filled with many good people that do want to help their clients. Mm -hmm. Um, But my mind just started to expand beyond what the existing structure was. So it was time for me to, as Melissa would say, go rogue, go independent and build my business in a way that I could really stand behind what I was doing and what I was saying. Like I'm the product. People are buying me. They're trusting me and my advice and my expertise because I don't have a product. I use product as tools to satisfy my clients long term goals. Mm, but really, I'm selling myself. I mean, most of my clients in the end, it's about trusting me and my recommendations. Yes. And knowing that you have taken the steps to put their best interests at the forefront, right? To prioritize. Oh, it, all my planning is old based. So I, I, you had mentioned, you know, sometimes people feel judged about their expenses or their budget or how much they've saved. And I tell people, I'm taking the goals you tell me you have 
and I'm letting you know what you're doing right now, where you're going to end up. And if you say, well, I want to end up here, not here, I can help you with steps, but this isn't my plan. It's me helping you work your plan. Right. And I, I, and I have a joke. I'm like, don't try to impress me with your expenses, but then the numbers are so wrong. Like, let's be realistic. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They're not helping anybody by doing that. If, like, if your budget is off by two grand a month because you're trying to cut all your numbers down to impress me, but that's not really your spending, then that doesn't do any of us any good. So no. <laughs> I'm not judging you. I'm just helping you determine where you're going to end up if you continue this pace and then help you with options or changes or products that will help you reach your goals. You know, they're not mine, they're yours. I'm just gonna help you be intentional in ways to accomplish your goals. Carmen, who do you typically work with? Who's your ideal kind of sweet spot of a client that you love to work with? I, The number one thing I love about a client is someone that is open-minded and wants advice. Oh. Someone who is ready, like mm -hmm. I want help, I'm ready to take action, I'm open-minded, and I try to really reassure people that, you know, a lot of people have never received any financial education in their life. You know, you grow up, you turn 18, you get a bank account, a couple years later you get married, you get a mortgage, you have credit cards, you have loans, and you've never been educated or taught. And so I never want to be condescending to my clients, I want to educate and empower them to understand a really complicated industry. Um, sometimes the toughest clients are people who are very intelligent in their field, but they haven't had training in finances and they feel self-conscious. Like I'm so smart, I'm successful, I'm a business owner or I'm a doctor, I should know how to do this myself. But yeah. they really received no training. And so the my number one client is someone that's open-minded. Um, I also love somebody who really embraces the planning process. So if you come to me and you say, I just retired yesterday, what do I do? Here's my money. I don't have the opportunity to affect as much change. But if you come to me and say, I would really like to retire in 10 years, what do I need to do between now and then? Then we've got a puzzle and we can start moving the pieces together. And that's where I get excited. Let's come up with a plan, what we wanna keep doing, what we wanna stop doing, how we wanna change, how do all these numbers fit together? And then I really get nerdy and get excited about piecing it all together. And I find that most of my clients, if they embrace the planning process and they're all in and they're ready, um, they feel better just having the plan. Even when we haven't even started working the plan, they feel like, okay, I've committed, I have a plan, I have some direction, I'm on the right path. And they almost instantly start feeling better about their finance, finances. It seems to lift a bit of a weight off their shoulders. Sure. I mean, you're taking this overwhelming, complex subject like retirement and that chunking it down to these little steps that they're going to do this year, the next year, and so on, instead of being this huge, it's hard for people to even fathom how much money they're going to need. How do I accumulate, save that much money or grow that much money? So many factors that go into place. So having that grounding plan is huge. I think the number one question is, well, how much do I need to retire? And I say, well, how much are you going to spend? Right? So <laughs> it's, it's not always how much money do you have or how much you spend. It's what's the difference between those two numbers? What kind of gap do we need to bridge with your investments to supplement you know, your income in the future? And if your hobbies are gardening and going for a walk, that's a lot different than someone's hobbies are golfing and cruising. Right. So it really comes down to customizing. I don't say, oh, you're 55 year old male with this much income. You're going into this column. It's really customized to that person's goals, whether it's buying a second home, you know, traveling the world or just not getting up and going to work every day. We can figure mm -hmm. that out. So as long as the client has clear cut goals, I can help them solve for it. Oh, good. Beautiful, Carmen. I have. Two trivia questions for you. We always ask our guests some trivia questions. So are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> We're going to test your knowledge, which as you can tell, ladies, she's very knowledgeable in this area. She's been in the industry for quite some time. All right. This one's true or false. Women are less successful than men when it comes to investing. Less successful. False. Mm -hmm. Good job. 
good job. Data shows that women outperform their male counterparts on an average of 0.4%, almost half a percent. They outperform the male counterparts. For it. I All right, would guess that it's probably two reasons. One, yeah. women tend to be a little more patient. So it, mm. it's time in the market, not timing the market. So, it, you know, not overreacting or trying to beat the market by trading too often or jumping in and out during volatile times. Mm. Um, I, and I think sometimes I don't want to, you know, judge men. I love them. Uh, but they can, it can be a little harder for them to take advice and they tend to want to manage their own money a little more often, or at least try it first and see how it works. You're right. Women are, do just seem to have more patience. I've noticed they also want to be very educated before they jump into anything. So patience, even jumping into it. And then while they're are invested in it as well. Yes. Right on the money there, Carmen. All right. Next question. Currently, women are managing more wealth than ever. In the U.S., women are overseeing how much money? So A is $1 million, 2 is $10 3 $25 million, or four, $4 billion? $1 billion, $10 trillion, $25 million, or $4 billion? $4 billion. It's actually $10 trillion. Wowzers. Or a third oh, of total US household financial assets. Yep, a third. So we, we still got room to go. And people like you, Carmen, are going to be huge in changing that, that statistic uh, for it. So very good. <laughs> give, her, give her a hand of applause for Carmen. Thank you. I want to talk about, so I read your book chapter, and I loved it. And you how you segued these different turning points in your career, I thought was very fresh and exciting. You started with usually a quote or an inspirational book, a mentor. Can you talk about how these three things have been a huge component in your career? Sure. So the title of my chapter is Live Your Best Life. So at every point in my life, I've thought I was living my best life right? Because you make decisions with the information you have at the time. And when you're young, you know, sometimes you just don't know. Um, and your influences when you're growing up are huge. You know, your parents, um, whatever you grow up with is what you think is normal mm -hmm. until you go out into the world, you get into relationships or you have a roommate or you get married and you realize how other family dynamics work. So whatever you're doing seems normal. So growing up in my household, my dad was the breadwinner. He ran all the money and he was always just like, if you can afford the payment, why wouldn't you do it? Like be responsible, but live life and have fun. So it was just a, always a structure of, well, we can make that payment. And so we'll do up to as many payments mm -hmm. as we can be on time and be responsible, but just have fun. And there wasn't a lot of talk about saving or investing because my dad was a public educator you know he knew he was earning a pension and worked for the state and had kind of regular cost of living increases mm -hmm. and so he really wasn't that organized with his finances uh, but he was successful enough to live a moderate lifestyle and have a little fun on the side and so that's just what we did so as soon as i graduated i thought i should just be able to start doing the same I, I was a bit entitled looking back. I was like, well, I have a college degree and I have a job in my industry. So I should be able to have a decent vehicle and, you know, maybe an apartment with a roommate and go out and have fun on the weekend. And that's what I did. But things were very tight, mm -hmm. very tight. And it was just like, well, charge it. We'll pay for it later. Hopefully we get a bonus. Hopefully we get a raise. Hopefully we get a tax return. Oh, I'll pick up a second job. You know, and I just was on the wheel. I was the hamster on the wheel. Yeah. But nobody was telling me it was wrong. It, it felt in my mind, I was like, well, I'm living the American dream. This is what this everybody's is doing. what it is. Yeah, everybody has the same story. Sure. It was, and I didn't even think of ways to get out of it. It was like, mm -hmm. I'll catch up eventually. I'll work a little harder. I'll get a promotion or I'll get a bonus. And we'll just keep going. And eventually I was working three jobs. I was actually staying after work two nights a week to clean the office 
when I worked at the insurance company. To get some extra money. Yeah. So that gave me a couple hundred extra bucks a month back then. And then I was teaching classes at the local gym so that I could get a free gym membership. So I was getting up like (laughs) five in the morning and going and teaching spinning classes, then going to work at my insurance company and then staying when the doors locked at five o'clock and vacuuming and cleaning the toilet. Wow. When did you hit burnout? At some point. (laughs) (laughs) I did that for a long time. And unfortunately, while I was doing all that, I was burning out my marriage at the same time. Um, Because I had all these goals and I was set in the way I was doing things and it wasn't aligned. And my spouse did not have that kind of energy or attitude or zest (laughs) and we weren't matching up. So my first time in my life that I started over from zero was at 29 years old and I got divorced and actually gave my condo to my ex and I had to pay him to take it. (laughs) And I walked away with student loan debt, credit card debt, no place to live. And then within nine months, I quit my salary job and went to work at the bank. So I really started at zero. Yeah, I was underwater. Um, And so I was at that point starting, it had been, a good seven years of, you know, fun and not changing. I was just in a hole. I wasn't crawling out. And so Melissa had encouraged me to take the leap. And and so I finally did. So I started at zero at 29. At 29. What pulled you through those moments? Because I'm sure there were times when you just probably didn't even want to get out of bed. What pulled you, know, you through? I think I just had this philosophy that was still from my childhood of just if you work hard it's going to be okay so i still felt like you're smart you're a hard worker yeah good it it was just getting the courage to kind of break off those golden handcuffs and i just kept saying this can't be it like this can't be what life's about like there's got to be more it's got to be better and of course the old adage it's not what you know it's who you know you know melissa was a great influence on me and kind of encouraging me to try something different, take a leap, take more control. So it was kind of all at the same time that I released some of my financial burdens and kept working hard and took a leap with a new career to give myself a fresh start. Wow. What a story, Carmen. What a turn. We're not even halfway yet. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Yes. (laughs) Yes. So it's interesting. You say, each time you thought you were right living the, your best life and then you learn there's a next level and a next level and a next level and it seems a theme with these different mentors inspirational people kept you looking around and reevaluating things and saying yeah, and it, what can change part of it is like leaving your family so i have a very close family and my dad was smart and successful and we were a very loving unit and they had my back but they only knew what they knew mm-hmm. And so I, you know, Melissa became more of a mentor. I kind of stepped away from my family to someone that was more at my place in life, going through the things I was going through, wanting to build a career in business. And so then she kind of became my new mentor and she was working Dave Ramsey's plan. So I did a 180 and I began delaying gratification, paying off debt, living like no one else so I could live like no one else. And then it was the journey to dig myself out of a hole that I that I had dug. And it was fun getting in that hole, but it was not fun digging out of it. And it takes a heck of a lot longer to crawl out than it does to fall in, I can tell you that. Wow. So then I just became obsessed with making all these positive financial changes. Yes. And, building and so, up that little bit of momentum that just and then it is addicting it's like i paid off my credit card i am credit card dot free and then you feel lighter and then you're like well i want to keep going and then i had a a lease and i got rid of my lease and bought a junky beater car and it was like okay that's paid off and then you just get lighter and lighter and lighter 
you know, and then paying off the student loans and just becoming free and then making more money and spending less. And when you change both those things at the same time, you really, and I had just grown up like, like I said, just make your payments on time, be responsible. And I never even dreamed you could live a life with no car payment. Sure. Or, you know, everyone just said, well, you'll always have a car payment. That was yeah. the mantra in my family. And I never want one again. They stink. <laughs> yes. Once you get rid of them, I'm my car off a year or two ago. It's incredible. Incredible. Well, we have to go to a quick commercial break, but I do want to end with as you're talking about these we all know there's compounding interest on our money right our money starts to earn money and then that money is earning money when it's invested properly and so on but there's compounding interest in your behaviors and that's what you just said right one thing gets paid off and then you get to tackle another thing gets paid off and then you start paying cash for things and there's no payment so nothing has to get paid off right and it just keeps building and building and building it's this huge snowball ripple effect which is huge but it's just knowing what is that first even if it's a small step and then from there you get to build and it becomes this massive right empire that you end up having in the end so stay with us we're going to be right back and carmen's going to give us her hot money tip everyone's curious now because you really teed that up beautifully <laughs> <laughs> and her financial trends all right so we'll see you in a few seconds each lady at the woman's wealth boutique shares their asset, their magic that they bring to the world. Bringing women together for the greater good is my greatest asset. Uniting women to make huge impacts on women with their wealth. Money is power. Money is a tool to get you the life you desire, to make your own impact, your own legacy. You are worthy of this wealth. If you don't believe me, you can hear it from every single woman at the Women's Wealth Boutique. Hearing new beliefs from experts is another way to rewire your brain. So let's begin with your own healing. You are worthy to invest in yourself. You are worthy of millions, of billions. You are worthy of God's blessings. You are worthy of all the desires you've ever had. You are worthy. We aren't called financial trendsetters for nothing at the Women's Wealth Boutique. Each journey with these ladies, you will see new, innovative, trailblazing strategies that we use with our clients. Our mission is to impact millions of women around the world with their wealth. We are doing things differently at the Women's Wealth Boutique. We are challenging the status quo at the Women's Wealth Boutique. We are here for change to disrupt the financial industry. We are back with Carmen Gearhart from Michigan, one of our amazing co-authors of our upcoming book, Financial Trendsetters, coming February 2024. So Carmen, it is time for your hot money tip. I cannot wait to hear what you have for us. So what is your tip for our ladies watching us tonight? So I want you to do what I've always done. And when you get lemons, you make lemonade. And so I always tell my clients, you know, when you invest with me or work with me, there are going to be times when you lose money, right? So how can we take advantage of down markets? So when there's a bad year in the market, you're getting your statements, your accounts are down. That's the perfect time to add more. It's the perfect time to maybe convert an old IRA into a Roth. There's a lot of ways you can take advantage. And I tell people the rich get richer when the market is down. People who don't run scared and dive in and try to make lemonade out of those lemons are the ones that are way better off in the long term. Oh, yes. Amen, Carmen. It is true. Yes, the wealth get wealthier, rich get richer. I've been hearing a lot, wealth is silent. Money is loud, but wealth is silent. 
And it's those people that they are very confident and really assured in the decisions that they're making with their money. And they're not going to flip flop, second guess themselves. They have this assertiveness about them when they're making these decisions and they're not second guessing it when it comes down. They're actually, they're doubling down. They're adding money to it. I love that tip, Carmen. Beautiful. How about switching gears here? What is your financial trend? And in our book, Financial Trendsetters, you're going to hear all of the trends from our co-authors, everything from women in wealth, women in the financial industry, women in business. So what is your trend that you are seeing with women and their money lately? Well, I'm really excited about what I'm seeing because what I knew to be true, but I proved by surveying all my friends and family and compiling the results is that women are involved in managing the money and making household budgeting decisions. So it used to be back when I started in the industry, it was like, oh, you're a woman, maybe you should work with all widows because they don't know what they're doing and you can help them and guide them and you're a woman helping a woman. But 80% of women are either running the money or 50-50 involved with running the money with their partner. So that that's going away, this widow who's all of a sudden her husband dies and she just doesn't know what to do. Women are taking control. They want to be educated and empowered about money. And especially my generation, you know, I'm in my 40s. Most of my friends are the ones that run the money, do the budget, pay the bills. And they are either meeting with their financial advisor or going with and they're doing it, you know, together with their spouse. So they're not women are not in the dark anymore. They are involved and, and taking control. And I love to see that. Um, when I was in college taking finance classes, there was about 10% females wow. majoring in finance. Yep. And even still to this day, if I go to a meeting, you know, in the city and it's like a continuing education or an economic summit, it's primarily men in the room. And so I get excited that women are taking more control. And I think things will look a lot differently as time continues to march on. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you. And you could just even imagine as more women are in the workforce and it's a dual income household, the women, they're going to have some sort of 401k, 403b something. That's their foot in the door of starting to manage the household's portfolio, the investment. Well, they have their own assets with their own name on it. Yes. So, it, and they have opportunity to get more education outside of that also. So there's just, education's everywhere. That's some of the good part of the internet, right? Um, is that people, they might feel self-conscious, but they can start doing a little reading, doing a little studying, and then prepare themselves to ask questions when they're in front of a professional so that they feel that they've done their due diligence. Yes, how many times we're constantly reading or listening to audio books on different concepts to feel, oh, now I can contribute to this conversation. I'm asking the right questions instead of being just overwhelmed. I don't know what to ask an advisor. I don't know if I have enough money to work with them. Anything like that too. That's why I love this show, right? Getting that education out there. Carmen, where do you see this trend going? Uh, how is it gonna impact future generations? Well, I know that I already talked to my 10 year old son about money more than my parents talked to me. Um, and I think that because the days of the pension are kind of going away and it's really up to most individuals to save for their own future, you really can't count on someone else to do it for you. Um, I'm noticing my nieces are 20 and 22 and they're already asking questions, thinking about it, talking about it. They did learn about it in school. I didn't learn about anything like this in high school. Um, but our local high school has a personal finance class. And so these kids are starting out like they know what a Roth IRA is. They're thinking about investing their graduation money and getting started young because they now understand the power of compounding and they understand the time value of money. And just those basic concepts are the building blocks to financial wealth and education. Oh, sure. Sure. Well, thank you so much, Carmen. She was talking about trusting your instincts. Know when the markets are going down, adding more money to it. That's when the wealth get richer. 
as her hot money tip, talking about her financial trend where more women are engaged in the conversations and active management of the household, the income, but also the assets as well, and having assets in their own name, which is huge. And that is going to change that next generation. They're witnessing it, right? Our kids, whatever age, their first thing is observing what the parents are doing and seeing that talking with your kids at an early age, bringing them into the conversation as well is huge. Carmen, thank you so much. Where can people find you? We have you up here on our screen. There I am. Where can people find you, Carmen? CarmelFinancial.com. CarmelFinancial.com. She's in our book, Financial Trendsetters. Her chapter is very strong. You got to hear her. Thank you for being so vulnerable as you're sharing your story with us tonight. It is so impressive. You're welcome to stay with us because we're going to go into the last segment of our show to round out. You said living your dream life. So we're going to do a meditation on exactly that. What does that look feel like? Who is that person that you need to step into to allow yourself to really live that dream life and enjoy it? But first, Carmen, thank you so much for being with us here tonight on Women by the Millions. It's been a pleasure. It went so fast. I said before, you are such an amazing woman advisor, and thank you for sharing your story with us. Really incredible. Thank you. On. And with that, I'm going to invite all of our guests, everybody watching us tonight. Thank you for being with us and supporting our incredible show, Women Behind the Millions. And we're going to lead you through a nice little meditation to close out the evening with us. So here's a shout out to our course Lift, where you get 10 weeks of money meditations, prayers, journal work to really embrace the wealth that deep down you knew all along that you had in you, but you just feel this kind of invisible block wall up that you can't seem to push past. So let's push past it right now, tonight. You can grab the course Lift with a QR code right there. Just scan it and grab yourself a copy of it. And I invite you to get comfortable and close your eyes and take a deep breath in. And as you breathe out, do a nice loud sigh. Ooh, whatever it sounds like. It could be high, it can be low, but just uh, breathe it out. And as you breathe in, you're breathing in all that positive, bright energy, that light, and just feel it fill your chest your lungs, and as you breathe out, you're breathing out all that anger, resentment, stress, overwhelm. As you breathe in, that light gets brighter as it's filling up all that's inside of you. It's filling up your chest, your stomach, your legs down to your feet, your arms, your head, your necks. And you release your jaw. You release your stomach. Anything that still feels tight, give it an extra breath or two. And you picture this light just emulating outside of you. Picture the color, the hue of it. And see where it wants to take you. Maybe it wants to bring you on a walk here by the beach or on a lake in the mountains. Maybe you just curl it up by the fireplace. And this light brings you to your future self a year from now. And picture what your future self is doing. Maybe on stage, maybe celebrating a new one at work. Maybe it's having your book in your hands, the actual hard copy of your book, being with your family. And your future self has something they want to share with you. And let your future self talk. What does that message it's been trying to get through to you? Honor it with some time right now as you take it in. 
What is that important message, that lesson? Take it in. Thank your future self for being there for you and always guiding you and showing you and invite your future self to continue to be with you and to share and be able to talk with them all throughout the year knowing that they are always there looking out for you that you are always safe and loved what is the energy around this version of you the confidence the excitement the energy the love feel that now as you merge with your future self and welcome it all in and know that this feeling is there for you all throughout the year whenever you need to tap into it you already have become your future self the future version of you it is already done it's you are already on your way to accomplishing everything that you have set out to accomplish over the course of the year. Just remember that there's trust, faith, and patience in all of it. And to remember to always be gra- grateful, to express that gratitude for the guidance shown you tonight. And with that, I will wish you all a wonderful night. Thank you for tuning in. I know the energy has completely shifted through that work, but thank you for tuning in to Women Behind the Millions, living your best life, your dream life. What does that look like? Picture it, feel it, become it, because that's the best part of life is just playing in that creative space and seeing what are the possibilities. Think outside the box, get outside your head, get into your heart more and think, right? If money wasn't an object, if work wasn't a deciding factor, what would you be doing right now? How can you encompass that? And Carmen is here to show you how to do it in regards to the money and setting the plan and setting the goals and getting everybody on board with that purpose. So we will see you next week on Women Behind the Millions. Thank you again, Carmen, for being with us tonight. Thank you. Hey, Money Queens, looking to get your wealth to that next level, 789 figures. Follow us on Instagram at PinkFixMyMoney and at Women's Wealth Boutique for more millionaire money tips.